As an overview of the research that I do, the main aim of it really is to help improve the production of and demand for sustainable seafood. Now, why? Well, we have a real key problem worldwide, and that is that we're over-consuming nutrient-poor, energy-rich food. That's worldwide. That's not just in the West, not just in the UK and the US. That's a worldwide issue. And if you look at foods we consume, uh, about 70% of our diets worldwide are based upon uh, highly processed vegetable oils, cereals, sugars, uh, and also alcohol. And they're quite nutrient-poor foods. Meat and fish are particularly nutrient-rich, but there are issues. You know, meat is responsible for some of our biggest greenhouse gas emissions. With fish, we've got issues with overfishing uh, and an aquaculture industry which is expanding and reliant upon wild-caught fish to support itself. And there's a real need for a kind of nutrient-rich food source which doesn't cost the earth uh, and is efficient to farm. And that's why I'm looking at um, sustainable seafood and one of the key species we look at are bivalve shellfish. So things like clams, mussels and oysters. They're shellfish with two shells. Uh, and these are some of the most sustainable foods on the planet. I've just told you that bivalve shellfish, so clams, mussels and oysters, are a really, really good food type. Very, very sustainable and very nutrient rich. But there are really some kind of key barriers to expanding the production of and demand for these foods. And this is across the value chain, everything from hatcheries breeding juveniles to uh, grow out operators growing shellfish out in the sea to transport, storage, distribution, processing and eventual marketing to consumers. Now, perhaps the biggest barriers in production are in the supply of juveniles, so the bivalve seed that you need to um, grow out bivalves on reefs. Uh, and on the demand end, we've got a real issue in that bivalves, particularly in the UK, uh, particularly in a lot of Europe and developed nations, they're not a very popular food type. Uh, they're a bit of a taboo. They're, you know, kind of seen as a fringe item on supermarket shelves. And people often say they're kind of unfamiliar with cooking them um, or they're worried about safety. And there's a real need to kind of develop mass market convenience, consumer products from bivalves to kind of help drive that demand. So that's some of the kind of key issues uh, in the bivalve supply chain. One of the projects we've got running in the laboratories here in the David Atmer building, part of the Cambridge Conservation Initiative, is the project looking at urban growth of bivalves, so the urban farming concept. Now this is being run by my PhD student Broderick, and what we have here is we have uh, a selection of tanks in which we're growing bivalves and in these tanks we're applying different conditions so different temperatures different salinities different formulations of salt water different feeds and we're trying to work out what the most optimal combinations are to get really really fast growth of bivalves and we're applying this not only to juveniles and growth but we're also looking at how we can use this at the finishing step in bivalve production to achieve really, really high quality, kind of fully fattened up adults. The other thing we're trialing out here is we're looking at depuration techniques. That is methods of really purifying your bivalve at the point of harvest. So we're looking at chelating agents for removing some of those heavy metals which can accumulate in shellfish and also ways of further reducing the bacterial load of those shellfish. So what we have here is blue mussels and these mussels are growing in the lab as part of experiments where we're aiming to test the effectiveness of fortifying mussels with extra nutrients, such as vitamin A, vitamin D. Uh, and this, this is really important applications for uh, new bivalve growth systems, such as urban bivalve aquaculture, where you might want to develop a system that allows you to grow bivalves faster than ever before, uh, and where you want to enhance the quality of bivalves both for the consumer market uh, and also potentially as a way of providing extra nutrients to communities that don't have access to those nutrients in other parts of their diet. Bivalve consumption varies enormously worldwide. There's a huge contrast. In China, um, so for example, regions such as Shandong, consumption per capita is over 100 kilos. If we move over to Europe, our highest consumers such as Portugal and Belgium are looking at kind of four or five kilos. 
In the UK, it's even lower. Uh, and in some nations, it's kind of less than 200 grams per capita. So there's absolutely huge variation. Now, how do we change this? How do we get increased consumption on a global level? Well, one of the ways is to work with food manufacturers to come up with convenient, appealing, and affordable bivalve products that fit the tastes uh, and fit the needs of consumers in different regions. Now, for the past couple of years, we've been working with Nomad Foods. Nomad Foods are Europe's largest frozen food ma manufacturer, one of the largest in the world. They own brands such as Birdseye, Findus, Iglo, and Goodfellas. And what we've been trying to do is look at the mass market opportunities for bivalve shellfish and what the most effective mechanisms could be to put them in food products that people love and enjoy to bring that nutritional and sustainability benefit to people. Now, there could be two ways of doing this. It could involve us putting uh, bivalve food products into familiar things like fish fingers, uh, fish cakes, curries, stews, cakes, that kind of thing. Or it can involve working with celebrity chefs and restaurants to try and promote some of the more traditional bivalve recipes uh, and give consumers that greater confidence to purchase those ingredients in the supermarket and cook them for themselves at home. So there's a kind of two-pronged strategy we can work out there. One of the key questions in trying to increase consumption of things like mussels and clams is will it be more effective to try and promote quite traditional recipes such as mool frite um, or kind of clams uh, in a sauce or will it be more effective to try and incorporate things like mussels and clams into foods people are already familiar with like fish cakes, fish fingers, burgers, that kind of thing. So they're kind of two approaches bivalves in the shell in those traditional dishes or bivalves kind of hidden in other foods in disguise. Now how do we test this? Well we've been working alongside Darwin College and what we've been doing there is we've been replacing the meat or fish options on the menu with bivalves either in the shell in a kind of traditional dish like more free or bivalves hidden in another food just as the meat so for example fish cakes and we're trying to see which of those options, bivalves in the shell or bivalves in other foods, actually drives greater sales uh, in relation to the meat or fish they're replacing. So that's the kind of rationale behind the work we're doing at Darwin. And we're seeing some really, really great results. So we've looked at uh, two ways that we can um, uh, bring uh, bivalves, specifically for us mussels, uh, onto the surgery, actually cooking them on their own, so mussels as a dish, Everyone knows Maul's Marinere, looking at dishes for those. We bring those uh, in twice a week. Um, and then the following week, uh, like today, we include the mussels in a dish. So that today we've had um, hake with mussels in the sauce and the spinach, or we might include them in a, in a curry or a fish cake. So we're looking at these different areas of, of bringing the mussels in, see how, what interest uh, that generates. Uh, so when we bring new dishes in, there's always a positive response to that. And to the mussels, the first time we brought mussels in here, have been a very positive response. I think people are uh, more open to change, uh, to, well, they trust us in the food, first of all. So they're more open to, to trying new things here. Uh, and if, if they want something, we'll give them a little taster first. You know, if they haven't eaten a mussel before, they can taste one if they like it. Uh, we give it there, so no, positive. Um, I thought the fish dish with mussels was really nice. Um, I like I like white fish um, for lunch especially, so yeah, no, I thought it was really nice. It was full of flavour. Um, the mussels in particular, I think, um, worked really well with the fish, so it was, it was nice. The mussels were really firm actually, very plump. I was quite surprised because sometimes you can get mussels and they're a bit rubbery and hard, but these were cooked really, really well. And like I said, they complemented the, um, the fish and the sort of texture of the fish. And, and yeah, the whole, the whole dish worked really, really well together. We've kept the price points um, the same as we would with similar dishes. So sort of the high protein uh, items, we kept them at the same price points uh, with that because the cost is, is basically the same to us. We're heavily subsidised uh, with the prices, so we, we still need to cover our costs, um, but also we can't, um, we can't really increase our prices much um, because you know, student welfare is, is a key to, to why we serve foods.
uh, to, to make food accessible. So yeah, the, the price points are similar to what they would be for similar protein mm. dishes. One of the other bits of research our team's looking at is the concept of urban bivalves. So farming bivalves away from the sea in controlled, enclosed, um, highly optimized conditions. Now, one of my PhD students, Broderick House, is working on this project actually. And um, what this involves doing is setting up enclosed tanks in which we take our mussels or clams uh, and we provide them with an optimal formula of nutrients, uh, perfect water quality, um, the correct temperatures, all of the great conditions for growth. Uh, and we can support these bivalves with sustainable feedstocks, so for example, food waste, uh, and kind of byproducts from the food industry and other industries. And the real aim of this is to allow us to produce bivalves faster than previously possible, uh, utilize urban space, which might not be used for anything else. And also the key thing here is that we can fully optimize the quality and the food safety of these shellfish because we're controlling all of the parameters and that can lead to a really, really high quality product. This could have application not only in developing uh, high value products, but also in kind of purifying products already grown in the sea as a kind of finishing step at the end of harvest. One of the other really exciting bits of research we're doing is shellless clam growth. Now, if I tell you about a clam which can reach a meter in length in just six months and can eat wood uh, and can eat rock and was responsible for stranding Columbus in the Caribbean, you probably won't believe me. But they do exist, they grow worldwide. Uh, these clams are a delicacy in the Philippines. They're eaten by natives as a kind of really popular cultural delicacy. And we're trying to work out, could we grow these species on a very large scale as a food product? They're very nutrient rich, just like regular clams, but with that fast growth potential and the potential to feed them on really sustainable feedstocks, such as wood uh, or algae, they could really be a food of the future. Think about them on par with termites, insects, seaweed, all of those fast developing food sources for the future. But not only could they be good for food, they've got some really, really interesting other properties which we could exploit. For example, in their gut, the symbiotic bacteria, which help them break down things like wood or rock, also have other unique properties. They, develop, they, they produce antimicrobial compounds, which could be the backbone behind new antibiotics or medical drugs. So there's really a lot of value in exploring these species uh, as a real kind of, you know, opportunity for science.